this tax hike, it's become quite a headache for the federal government. Well, I think it's a, a modest proposal and it's been turned into the end of the world in the sort of stories that are out there today. The difference we've got here is, is hyper-stupidity in the media and some of the stories that we've seen that have beaten it up uh, to the point that it's not even recognisable as the original proposal. Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. And welcome to a super fuss about your super, which has many in the media outraged on your behalf. Super, super betrayal. betrayal. PM super dupe. Super size backflip. The superannuation tax changes proposed by Labor won't take effect until 2025, and they'll only go ahead if voters re-elect this government. But that didn't stop TV and the tabloids branding it a broken promise and a breach of trust. And somehow the changes became an attack on all Australians, even though they will initially affect only 80,000 taxpayers who have more than $3 million in their super funds. As the PM explained... 99.5% of people with superannuation are unaffected by this reform. Among the 0.5% who are, one mystery Australian with $544 million in super, 17 with over $100 million, 7,000 over 10 and 30,000 above $5 million. None of that context was enough to calm the media hue and cry or stop the scare about what the government will target next, which the Herald Sun's Terry McCran suggested could be a tax on family homes. And on sunrise Wednesday morning, David Koch was revving it up with Treasurer Jim Chalmers. What's next? Can you guarantee no change ever to the capital gains tax exemption on the family home? It was a dumb question, really, in that no politician would dare to do it, especially if they have to take it to an election, as Labor has said it will do. But the answer from Chalmers, we are not contemplating it, was just as bad, and it dominated the headlines. Minutes later, on the ABC's RM Breakfast, Patricia Carvelis was trying to get the PM to rule it out, and she had more success. We are not going to impact uh, the family home. Why not? Full stop, exclamation mark, because it's a bad Rational. idea. But that didn't stop Sky News, news.com.au and the Daily Mail expressing glee and outrage at the Treasurer's failure to promise your home is safe. And at his midday press conference, he was forced to do exactly that. Here's your opportunity to do the same. Yeah, I do do that. Um, and I should have done that this morning too. It was dumb of Chalmers not to dismiss it in the first place, but tiresome of the media to go for the gotcha and then, with help from the Coalition, pump up the Treasurer and PM's differing responses into a story of the two men at war. Meanwhile, the Australian was declaring another war was coming between the classes. Albanese launches class war fight with Dutton over retirement savings. On Wednesday, the Australian's front page had five negative stories about the proposed super changes including one with wealth manager John Abernethy saying it was unfair to victimise the poor over 60s. I don't think $3 million is a lot of money. If you've got someone who has put all of their money into super, doesn't own their own home and is renting, this person will be seriously stuffed by this sort of change. Really? So how many people with $3 million in super are so stuffed they don't own their own home? Not many, I'd guess. And certainly not retiree Malcolm Clyde, a former lobbyist for self-managed super, who complained to the Australian... During my working life, I gave up on buying a nicer car, going overseas on holidays, and put that money into super. I was contributing on the promise by the government that those funds would be concessionally taxed. They're going back on that promise. In fact, the generous tax breaks that helped Clyde build his nest egg are his for keeps, even if the tax rate on his earnings may increase. And it seems he didn't sacrifice everything for super. Clyde and his wife recently sold their iconic Mossman apartment with exquisite interiors, lush manicured gardens and swimming pool tiled in Spanish glass mosaic for $7 million. He also recently sold his sailing yacht, seen here on a good breeze on Sydney Harbour. Clyde told MediaWatch he's not upset about the increased tax, but that piecemeal changes like this, aimed at the top end of town, fail to address the need for broader reforms. However, even after the changes, retirees like him would pay less tax than the average wage earner. Earnings on the first $1.7 million of their super would still be tax-free, and they'd pay only 6.5% on earnings from the first $3 million. So it's a bit hard to claim they will be hard done by or paying more than their fair share. 
As the CEO of National Australia Bank told the ABC on Friday... I think three million's a lot of money, and at 4% return on that, I'm pretty sure after tax somebody could live on 120,000. It's not a bad sum of money. And it's even harder to take this sort of headline seriously. It's ridiculous. Billionaire John Gandalf slams super tax change. Yep, it's ridiculous, all right. The Age and Sydney Morning Herald headlining a billionaire developer's dislike of the proposal. Cue the chaser and the shovel to poke fun at media outrage over all this hardship with stories like this. Retiree may be forced to sell fourth house under brutal superannuation shake-up. Mossman protester throws glass of 94 Penfolds Grange on famous artwork to raise awareness about superannuation changes. And even Nine's Today Show could sense the comic potential, dispatching Lara Vella to one of Australia's richest suburbs to file this cheeky report. <laughs> oh, look, it's tough out here on the streets of Double Bay this morning, Carl and Sarah. You know, the community, they are counting their pennies, they are counting the stacks of $100 bills that they have strategically placed throughout their penthouses and mansions in case of a rainy day. Because this is basically a class warfare, and let's face it, no-one likes it when the rich are the targets, do they? <laughs> So, what do the punters reckon? According to the latest news poll, the majority of voters support Labor's plan, with nearly two-thirds giving it the thumbs up. No doubt that will shock some media commentators who argue the sky is about to fall in. But as former Liberal leader John Hewson wrote in the Saturday paper... It is most unfortunate that some journalists can't move beyond the gotcha. They are obsessed with the idea of broken promises at the expense of recognising the real revenue problems the country faces or acknowledging the unfairness that is built into our tax system. Not long ago, the media were fixed on Labor's debt and deficit disaster. But now, with debt and deficits much higher, that urgency seems to have vanished. So how can something once deemed so dangerous no longer be an issue? And how can a modest proposal on super that needs voter approval constitute a catastrophe? Do the media have no shame or simply no idea? But now to a crisis at the very top of Australian politics, which you probably didn't hear about. Anthony Albanese will have to go. The most wicked and evil and divisive and dangerous thing any Prime Minister could say. It's sneaky and sleazy and creepy, and the guy should step down right now. He should be put in jail. Yep, lock him up, said Ralph, a caller to Sydney's 2SM, which is home to talkback legend Don Laws and broadcast on dozens of regional stations around Australia. And what terrible thing had the PM said? Can you believe our Prime Minister is trying to minimise the shame of being a pedophile? Really? That was after news presenter Pete Davis reading an email from a listener ten days ago, supposedly quoting in black and white from Albanese's own Twitter account. He says, I would like to insist the importance of using the term minor attracted persons instead of pedophile because it's less stigmatising. And he also says in this tweet of July 25, 2022, the term groomer is also offensive and should be banned. Yes, our woke PM was trying to protect pedophiles. And it had been right under everyone's noses since last July. And before long, two SM callers were on the line. We've got a Prime Minister saying that pedophiles should be referred to as minor attracted persons. It's hard to believe. It was, but... Saturday morning host Barry Hill obviously had no problem. And he read the offending tweet again, stoking more outrage. Yeah, you're a pedophile, you're a pedophile. And Hill wasn't the last. Step up a third to SM presenter, Saturday afternoon host Dean Mackin, a former One Nation and Palmer United Party candidate, who read the tweet again and then really teed off on the PM. He has the intuition of a lobotomised gnat. He wants to control what you can say. He wants to control what comes out of your mouth. It's just mad. You can't make this stuff up, can you? You just can't, cannot make it up. You surely can't. And callers were now really spitting chips. He supports the fame and rock spiders this guy. He's, out there. He's trying to protect the predators with what he's saying. What an absolute creep. You're a fame and creep, Albo. But was it really Albo? Well, seven months on, the tweet was still live on Twitter for all to see. And if you looked closely at the name, it really wasn't hard to spot. What's more, the account profile made it even clearer. Fake Prime Minister of Australia, unauthorised by Anthony Albanese. And some of the supposed PM's other tweets also gave the game away, such as... Australia is proud to stand in support of the Taliban. 
and this one. Next week, every Australian citizen will be forced to pledge allegiance to the pride flag. Whoops. Seems some callers did pick up the clues and let Dean Mackin know, leaving him to sheepishly report late Saturday afternoon. That account, if you have a look at it, uh, you look at it very carefully, you'll find it's a, it's a parody account. All that kerfuffle is because somebody's got a parody account up there and uh, that shouldn't be there, absolutely should not be there, and they need to get that down. Why Elon Musk is allowing that account to stay up there? Yes, the whole kerfuffle was Elon's fault. As if three radio broadcasters should be expected to see any of the very obvious clues that it was complete bullshit. And what did the station have to say for itself? Affirm no comment, although they did admit they've had a complaint. Surprise, surprise. And finally, to the ABC, which has been forced to correct a story on Pfizer, the big US drug company that makes a COVID vaccine. Last month, in an undercover sting by the right-wing gotcha outfit Project Veritas, a supposed research director of Pfizer, was caught making alarming claims about the safety of Pfizer's vaccine. Because it has to be impacting something hormonal to impact menstrual cycles. Right. So somehow the vaccine must be interacting with like the axis signal, the HPG axis, to cause these changes in menstrual cycles. After the video went viral on social media, the ABC ran a story on radio bulletins around the country, which introduced that grab like this. The Director of Research and Development at Pfizer, Jordan Tristan Walker, has been filmed in an undercover video. The US-based investigative news organisation Project Veritas has released the video in which Mr Walker says there is something irregular about menstrual cycles. After complaints to the ABC and a finding by its ombudsman, the ABC has now run a correction online, admitting... The story should not have been broadcast, as the source was not verified and the descriptor used for Project Veritas was also inaccurate. We'd certainly agree with that. Project Veritas has a terrible record of dodgy editing, breaching ethics and distorting facts. Jordan Walker is almost certainly not the research director of Pfizer, and the video is so heavily edited you can't be sure he's not been taken wildly out of context. But if Walker is telling the truth, some of his claims, like this one about experimenting with viruses, were surely worth investigating. We put them in the virus in these monkeys, okay. and then we successively like cause them to keep infecting each other. You know, there's all these new strains of variants that just pop up. Why yeah. don't we try to like catch them before they pop up in nature, and we can develop a vaccine prophylactic for like new variants? So, did Pfizer reply that those claims were nonsense? Not exactly. After Project Veritas put the video out on Twitter and got 49 million views, Pfizer issued a statement to say... In a limited number of cases, when a full virus does not contain any known gain-of-function mutations, such virus may be engineered to enable the assessment of antiviral activity in cells. So, how did journalists react to this story? Most on the left simply ignored it, or ran with all the reasons why Project Veritas could not be trusted. Some on the right, like Fox's Tucker Carlson, shouted it from the rooftops and drew all sorts of crazy conclusions. And the Australian split the difference by giving it a front page plug that pointed to an op-ed by Adam Crichton, which said that even if the claims made by Walker were totally false... The fact tens of millions of people had seen them and Pfizer itself hadn't denied his employment surely warranted at least a short article or two. And we reckon that's right. Because one thing Pfizer has still not done is to say that Walker is not the director of research and that he does not work for them. And you really have to ask why. Surely it's also worth drilling into Pfizer's statement to figure out exactly what it means. As far as we can see, the only media organisation to have done that properly is Associated Press, who fact-checked the story, talked to the experts and concluded Pfizer was not doing anything alarming. That verdict, incidentally, is backed up by people we have spoken to, including the ANU's Dr Gaetan Bergio, an expert in infectious diseases. And what does he have to say about Walker? Well, Walker does appear to be a real person and have a medical degree. But according to Dr Bergio, he is very confused. Walker's conflation of directed evolution with gain-of-function research is astonishing and, to be frank, gobsmacking for an allegedly R&D Pfizer senior executive. Net result, you could say, there is no story. So why bother? But we believe the media should at least have asked the question and checked whether Walker's claims had any merit, if only to debunk viral fake news that 49 million people may have lapped up. Allowing claims like that to sit there, unchecked and unchallenged, just helps to give them life. That's all from us for tonight. You can read a full statement from Gaten Bergio on our website. 
And don't forget, Media Bites, Thursdays on Facebook, YouTube and iView. But for now, until next week, goodbye. Mm -hmm.